pelo time. Ele tinha um chat sem querer. Ok, back, back to English. Um, somatic style. One of America's greatest minds and finest stylists, Ralph Waldo Emerson, declared, I quote, A man's style is his mind's voice. Wooden minds have wooden voices. If Emerson here defines style through the notion of mind, it is not to deny the somatic dimension of style. Style is essentially embodied, as Emerson's reference to voice clearly implies. Vocalization is clearly a bodily act, involving one's breath, vocal cords, and mouth. If we look at the concept of style through etymology, however, we find its somatic roots not in the orality of voice, but rather in the bodily gesture of inscription. The word derives from the Latin word stylus, one of whose primary meanings was a sharp instrument used by the Romans for writing and engraving on wax tablets. It thus came by implication to convey more generally the method of writing or engraving with any sharp or pointed instrument, such action implying somatic skill. From a particular physical tool or method of writing, one notably different from the traditional Chinese use of a soft brush, style's primary meaning has evolved into a more abstract, literary, and lofty sense. Not merely a means of writing or making other kinds of signs, style has become an aesthetic quality whose creation and appreciation forms part of the end of writing and is indeed sought and cherished for its own intrinsic value. Some theorists, however, appeal to style's only instrumental origin in order to confine its role to a practical means for conveying thoughts so as to ensure that style will not distract from clarity and honesty of communication. This is the view of Emerson's friend and transcendentalist fellow traveler, Henry David Thoreau. I quote, Who cares what a man's style is, so long as it is intelligent? Literally and really, the style is not more than the stylus, the pen he writes with, and it is not worth scraping and polishing and building unless it will write his thoughts the better for it. It is something for use and not to look at." End of quote. If even a person's style of mind and thought is in some way bodily, whether through voice or writing, then what is a specifically somatic style? What are its distinctive components or dimensions? What features or uses of the body are especially formative or expressive of somatic style? Which senses and modalities of perception are engaged in our appreciation of somatic self. Before engaging such questions directly, I will frame them by considering five important distinctions that inhabit and structure the general concept of style, and thus also inform its more specific somatic version. This quintet of contrasting senses of style are the honorific versus the merely descriptive, the generic versus the personal, the explicitly conscious or reflective versus the merely spontaneous or unconscious, the voluntary versus the involuntary, the permanent versus the contextual. But before explaining these distinctions, let me offer two reasons why a philosopher should be interested in somatic style, even without my own special commitment to the field of some aesthetics. Though it seems unrelated to intellectual thought or reasoning, Somatic style can be very effective in communicating a philosopher's views and rendering them convincing. If philosophy is at least partly an expression of the philosopher's personality, as Nietzsche, William James, and others believe, then that personality would be more completely displayed in real-life, full-bodied encounters, which could reveal aspects of the philosopher's basic attitude toward life and society that his text conceals. If philosophy is also conceived as a way of life, then seeing the philosopher in a real-life context could likewise reveal whether he practiced what he seemed to preach. It is easier to say things than to do them. It is easier to lie in words than in one's body language. But somatic style can conversely give greater force to one's words and to one's philosophical ideas. Ideas. 
We learn from G. E. Moore's distinguished colleagues from Bloomsbury and Cambridge that his angelically sublime beauty and vehement body language gave him tremendous power and persuasion in philosophical discussion and debate. Somatic style likewise contributed to the communicative power of Ludwig Wittgenstein, another of Russell's renowned Cambridge philosophical colleagues. It helped endow Wittgenstein with an inspiring aura of intellectual brilliance that made his views and arguments more compelling through the power of his commanding personality. I quote one witness about Wittgenstein. His face was lean and brown. His profile was aquiline and strikingly beautiful. His look was concentrated. He made striking gestures with his hands. His face was remarkably mobile and expressive when he talked. His eyes were deep and often fierce in their expression. His whole personality was commanding, even imperial." End of quote. Wittgenstein surely knew that personality is expressed in one's somatic style, since he, inferred, since he affirmed, I quote, not only that the human body is the best picture of the human soul, but also that a man's style is the picture of it. Though the famous historian Edward Gibbon made the similar remark that style is the image of character, we could, I think, go further by arguing that the relationship is even closer than these picturing and image metaphors suggest. For they still imply a dualism of soma and psyche, that could allow cases like the portrait of Dorian Gray, in which the visible portrait or image of character remains eminently attractive, though the character has become hideously corrupt. Somatic style, then, is not simply an external image of character, but an integral expression or aspect of it. Because character is not merely a secret inner essence, but rather something intrinsically expressed or constituted, through somatic behavior, demeanor, and attitude. This key Confucian doctrine, that one's character and somatic comportment are essentially individual, explains why Confucius insists so much on the importance of countenance or demeanor in the practice of ethical virtues. The key virtue of filial piety, he tells us, requires showing the proper countenance rather than merely performing the dutiful action since one's somatic expression shows that one is doing the act with the proper feeling. Exemplary persons therefore insist on maintaining a dignified demeanor, I'm quoting from the woman, to keep violent and rancorous conduct at a distance, and maintaining a proper countenance to keep, trusted, to keep trust and confidence near at hand, end of quote. The essential connection of somatic and ethical style is also why Confucianism sees ritual and the fine arts, especially in music, poetry, dance, and calligraphy, as the two main pillars of ethics. Ritual, by stylizing our bodily actions and gestures, also shapes and harmonizes our character, both in terms of self-unity and in coordination with others in the social context. By developing the individual's sense of harmony, grace, and beauty, the arts thereby enhance his ability to express these qualities in his conduct and in his rapport with others. Playing music or dancing together creates harmonious habits that are both somatic and social. Because of the firm Confucian faith in the unity of the mental and somatic, a teacher can teach without words, but instead by his embodied example of behavior. Confucius therefore once proposed to stop speaking and teach wordlessly as nature does through somatic expression both in action and in rest. Thus his disciple Mencius could write, I quote, his every limb where it bears wordless testimony, end of quote. The corollary of this somatic expression of ethical teaching is that one cannot hide one's moral character even if one wants to because it is wicked. How can a man conceal his true character, as Mencius, when not only one's words, but also the pupil of one's eyes reveal it? These Confucian ideas of style and character are not without their echoes in the West, where we have Buffon's famous epigram, Le style c'est l'homme style is the man himself, 
which Wittgenstein unfortunately glosses in terms of a picturing metaphor that paradoxically divides or distances what Buffon was trying to bring together. The distinction of style, whether literary or otherwise, from the essence of a person's character and thought finds expression in other minor fields than picturing or imaging. One such distancing, distancing metaphor is that of clothes, which merely dress the body rather than being part of it. Typical here is Lord Chesterfield's remark, style is the dress of thought. As clothes dress the body to make it appear less coarse and more cultured, so style for Chesterfield renders our thoughts less crude, more cultured, and superior. But this metaphor can be turned around to style's disadvantage. As clothes conceal or disguise the body, so style can obscure or distort one's thoughts. Style here becomes artificial dressing that hides the real substance of one's thought, or that distracts our attention from even seeing that those thoughts have no real substance worth communicating, that they are full of manner but empty of matter. Style here becomes synonymous with artifice, pretension, virtuous ornament, feigning, and falseness. Thoreau's critique of style for its fuss of gilding and polishing is a response to such artificiality of style that rather than humbly serving the matter of thought, calls excessive attention to itself in the way that impractical fancy clothes often do. In advocating style that is simple, clear, practical, and sincere, Thoreau echoes the ideal of natural style praised by Blaise Pascal as delighting us through its refreshingly candid communication of the human soul, rather than the artificial posturing of an artist. I quote Pascal, when we see a natural style, we are astonished and delighted, for we expected to see an author, and instead we find a man, quote. This praise of natural style implies an endorsement of the intimate connection of style with character or personality. But what makes a style natural? And why should its being natural imply that it is also good? How does having a natural style differ from having no distinctive style at all, or no style worthy of the name, but instead merely acting in the most natural way available, or in an instinctive, thoughtless, uncultivated manner? How can a person develop or work on one's natural style without turning it into something affected or unnatural? Because such questions reflect the ambiguities of the concept of style, we should now turn to an analysis of its fivefold complexity. So, one. This term style is often used in an evaluative sense to praise someone or thing for having it. In describing someone as stylish, the implication is that the manifested style is good. But in another non-evaluative sense of the term, Everyone has his or her style of speech, writing, comportment, clothing, etc., even if that style is unattractive, outmoded, or lacking in style in the honorific sense. When we say something like, that's just John's style, the term means the distinctive way that John has of presenting himself or behaving. We could call this non-evaluative meaning of style descriptive, as long as we recognize that it does not really describe very much. If clothing belongs to somatic style, then somatic style surely involves this honorific descriptive ambiguity. But even stripping attire from the notion of somatic style, we can look at ways of walking, gesture, eating, getting in and out of one's seat, which are more or less stylish in the honorific sense, but which, no matter how unstylish, will exemplify style in the descriptive sense. For example, an awkwardly unattractive, yet idiosyncratic style of eating or walking. Two, style can be generic or personal. In painting, we can speak of a Baroque style or a Cubist style, but we can also speak of the individual styles of particular Baroque painters. To be a memorable painter or other kind of artist, one should have a distinctive personal style rather than simply exhibit a generic style. Developing such a signature style is part of what it is to be a successful artist. Of course, an artist might deploy a variety of styles, but we still look for a signature personal style in the different generic styles that the artist uses. 
a stylistic unity beneath those differences that expresses the individual's particular genes. Though the contrast between generic and individual style is usefully clear, it is worth noting that an individual's style can become so distinctive, influential, and recognizable that it can function also in a more generic way, in which it can be applied to other persons than the individual who defined it. We can thus speak of someone having a writing style that is Hemingway-esque. Somatic styles can likewise be generic and personal. Obviously, there are generic dressing styles, including the classificational styles of dress code, such as formal, semi-formal, business informal. Others are ethnic genre styles of dress, such as Japanese, Indian, Hasidic, or Scottish. While still others involve taste group styles, such as preppy, grunge, corporate, hip-hop. But within each genre of clothing style, an individual can still strive to find a personal style of her own. Somatic styles of movement can also be generic. A military drill sergeant walks and gestures differently than a sommelier, a nun differently than a runway model or a hooker. Their different generic somatic styles are incorporated habits instilled through practicing their professions. Sports can also create different generic somatic styles, and so we speak of a surfer's body or a sumo wrestler's bodily style. Musical subcultures likewise generate somatic styles that go beyond mere clothes. For instance, in hip-hop culture, the b-boy's way of walking and gesturing. Other generic somatic styles relate to age groups, but perhaps the most generic of somatic styles is that of gender itself a feminine way of looking, walking, gesturing, sitting, and so on, as opposed to a manly appearance, posture, or style of movement. But alongside such generic styles, each individual in these professions, subcultures, or age groups may have his or her own personal style of movement, a recognizable gait and manner of gesture. Even if the person herself does not consciously try to develop or display it, Indeed, even if she does not know that she manifests it. And this raises my third distinction within the concept of style. It's conscious, deliberate formation through explicit stylization versus its spontaneous, unreflective expression. Just as writers often strive consciously to develop or improve their literary style, so many people devote considerable conscious thought and effort on stylizing themselves somatically. <coughs> Somatic self-stylization generates an enormous commercial market that feeds the cosmetic, fashion, dieting, exercise, and plastic surgery industries, along with the advertising industry that supports them by stimulating our desire to stylize ourselves somatically. The desire typically takes the paradoxical form of wanting to fit in yet also to stand out as distinctive. In other words, self-styling involves conforming in some way to the norms of some social taste group, yet not allowing such conformity to generic style to preclude one's own individual expression. Within the realm of voluntary stylizing, we can distinguish between self-conscious, deliberative efforts to stylize, and on the other hand, spontaneous choices of style that are more or less unconscious expressions of personality or taste. In the former case, these conscious, deliberate efforts of self-stylizing may become evident also to those who regard that style. And if they find it too self-conscious and effortful, they are likely to criticize the style as effective or artificial. In contrast, one might point to the unreflective spontaneity of style in the latter case, as exemplifying natural style. But we must be careful to recognize that we are dealing here with a form of spontaneity that is not instinctive, but rather very much culturally conditioned. The individual simply absorbs a preference for certain somatic modes or models from the surrounding human environment, which is always already a social environment, and then unreflectively expresses such preference by spontaneously imitating them in her voluntary somatic behavior, 
how she walks, eats, dresses, and combs her hair. In such cases, it is one's habits rather than one's deliberative consciousness that performs one's self-stylization. And as habits recursively reinforce themselves, this form of self-stylization, though implicit and unplanned, can be extremely powerful. So if we speak of natural style here, it is the second nature of habit that one has integrated into one's character or personality. Style, including somatic style, is a disposition or habit to perform or appear in a certain manner or set of ways. Though habits involve automatic mechanisms and can lead to ruinous routines, habits can also be creative in adapting themselves to new conditions and incorporating new elements and applications to improve their utility. Indeed, the power of habit depends on such creative adaptation which ensures its reinforcement in a wide range of different conditions and uses. Four, as somatic style can be acquired and displayed unreflectively without conscious choice, so it can also be acquired and displayed without our choosing at all. This involuntary form of style can result, for example, from the way we are trained to walk or eat or from bodily habits developed through our occupations but also from the ways our genetic makeup shaped our bodies and our appetites. Here again, we could distinguish between involuntary expressions of somatic style of which one is not aware, and those of which one has explicit consciousness but cannot control. I may not be aware that I have a crude, unattractive manner of eating, or that I have a particular posture and that may be the main reason why I cannot choose or change these ways of eating or standing. But even if I were aware that I had a tendency to stutter or to sweat profusely, I might still not be able to change these dimensions of somatic style. Fifth point. Through its association with fashion, style is often seen as ephemeral. But having a personal style cannot be a mere momentary affair. It implies a tendency to behave or appear in a certain way, or range of related ways. It thus involves dispositions that imply repetition and enduring over time. For personal style to be recognized, individuated, and re-identified over time, it must to some extent be durable and lasting. Yet style also has its contextual or temporal dimension. One's basic style of writing or dress may be essentially permanent, yet certain contexts, whether of extreme formality and importance, or of urgency, intimacy, or informality, will demand variations of style. However casual or grungy one's normal style of dress, the context of attending a wedding or other formal affair will dictate a different sartorial style. One's style in writing a job application letter will be different from that of one's intimate cell phone text. Somatic style likewise inhabits this general distinction between the permanent and the contextual. The same person may have a morning somatic style, brimming with extremely brisk and energetic movement, often exacerbated by too much caffeine, that differs significantly from his evening style of motion and gesture, slower and wearier after a long day at the office. I would witness this metamorphosis regularly when I used to ride the commuter train between New York City and Philadelphia. As we know from other contexts, someone may be a somatic lamb in the classroom and a lioness in the bedroom, or vice versa. Somatic style is formed and expressed 